Bible today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and there we read, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good, news in the, king, the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. <coughs> Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Let us pray. The Lord, may your words only be spoken and your words only heard, and we do ask this all for your love's precious sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Today's gospel occurs very near the beginning of the, of the ministry of Jesus. It uh, comes right after the Sermon on the Mount. He's gathered the disciples together, and now he's sending them out on their very first mission trip, if you will. And in this, in this reading we have this morning, it really sets the stage for everything else that follows, and in a sense is absolutely essential to understand if we understand the work and ministry of Jesus at all. And everything basically narrows down on one sentence in today's reading and gets its focus there, and then it spreads back out into the life and ministry uh, that Jesus will do. And it's that sentence that, that says, Jesus saw them, had compassion on them, for they were helpless and harassed like a sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus sees the people around him, has compassion on the people around them, and that directs him in all that he does. That directs him to do the things that he does, healing every disease, dis-ease, and sickness, uh, for instance. And so the very ministry of Jesus, it was not primarily, primarily a ministry, uh, he didn't come primarily to instruct though the teachings of Jesus are very important, but that wasn't the primary reason he came. The primary reason Jesus came wasn't to inspire, though Jesus inspired a great many people in his day and continues to inspire people today and still. Still, He didn't come to judge the world. Jesus himself I said, I did not come to condemn the world. But Jesus came to show us how very much God loves us. In the old way of illustrating, to show us that God didn't just love us this much, this much, but this much and that God loves us with an infinite love. And though that gains its clearest expression in the cross, it's very much being expressed in today's reading as well, when again, Jesus sees the people around him, really sees the people around him. That's not easy to do. Most people won't do that. When he really does see them, he has compassion for them. His heart goes out to them, and this will direct everything he does. And what he's going to do is, by doing these things, he's going to demonstrate in word and deed how much God loves people. By the things that he does, he's going to help people see how much God loves them, how much God adores them. And what he's going to ask his disciples to do is the same thing, to do the same thing so that the way they love people, those people see how much Jesus loves them and ultimately how much God loves them. And you can take the things that Jesus commanded his disciples to do literally. I have no problem with that. If there is a God, and I believe there is, it shouldn't be too hard for a God to heal somebody, right? Or you can take them more metaphorically. When he says, heal those who are sick, he's talking about bringing health and wholeness where that's lacking. Where he says, raise the dead, he's talking about bringing life and vitality to those places where there's decay. When he talks about cleansing the lepers, he's talking about including those who are outcast. When he talks about, about casting out spirits, he's talking about freeing, from those, from free, freeing people from those uh, forces and dynamics that so often hold them in bondage. So you can take them quite literally. I have no trouble doing that personally, but you can understand them in a different sense as well. And it's going to be just as powerful in carrying out the ministry of Jesus, seeing the people around us, allowing our hearts to go out to those people, and caring for them accordingly. And this morning, I want to give you a very simple four-step process to do that. And we're going to run through it pretty quickly. It's a very simple process, but it's a very powerful process. 
And it's one that certainly is one I would encourage every dad to incorporate in his life. Uh, you know, Jesus sees people, cares for people, and then lets that direct his activities towards people. That's what a good father does. In fact, that's what a good husband or wife does. That's what a good son or daughter does. That's what a good friend does. A good friend sees their friends, allows their heart to go out to their friends, and then acts in ways that are in accord to what they know their friend really, really needs in life. And so anybody can practice this process, uh, but we're going to look at it specifically in terms of, of fathering. And it starts with simply being curious. It starts with simply being curious. As parents, we often think we know our kids. We birthed them, right? We saw them grow up. We know everything about them there is to know. No, we do not. Uh, our kids, we, quite frankly, there's lots and lots we don't know about our kids, and there's a lot of things in our kids' lives that, that would surprise us. And, and so it, it just it behooves us to be curious about our kids. And, and without being nosy, without being obtrusive, to genuinely be interested in their lives, to know their friends. You know, to, to visit with their friends. And again, there's a way to visit with friends without being nosy, without being intrusive. Uh, to get to know their friends, to talk with their friends, to express genuine interest. Your kids will, impress that, will, will appreciate that, and their friends will appreciate that. To know the music they listen to, to know the things that are interesting them and aren't interesting them. Uh, that only comes uh, through being curious. And kids, uh, it, the, one of the single best gifts you can give your parents is to be curious about them. One of the single best gifts. I know we look old and boring, but we weren't always. And, and, in, and in fact, <laughs> we aren't now, and you really want to know the truth. But, uh, uh, but, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in our lives, and you don't know the half of it. And so, and so I mean, it, it's just such a precious gift when kids take the time to sort of leave their own little worlds and say, hey, mom or dad, tell me a little bit about this. What was it like then? What was, uh, that you, you just, you have no idea what a gift that is you give to us uh, when you do that. So it all starts with, with being curious, uh, with realizing that we never really know another person. And every engagement with them is an opportunity to know them better and to be curious uh, uh, about who they are. The second uh, stage in this, in this process is simply to listen. And, you know, there's that heartbreaking song, uh, line in that first song we sang. Uh, From the moment I could talk, I was ordered to listen. I mean, oh, it's just such a heartbreaking. And, and, and you know, many of us sort of know what, 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 that, what that's like. And what happens is, again, the, the things that cause the relationships to break down is when we judge other people. And when we judge other people, what generally happens is they don't do something that we would do, and we think that what we would do is better and so in some way, shape, or form, what we're saying is we're superior. That's not lost on the other person, and the relationship breaks down. So when we judge a kid, as a, as a father, when, we, when, I, when, I, when I judge one of my kids, what I've generally, when I've generally done that, it was when one of my children has done something I wouldn't have done, and I think what I would have done was better. Uh, and I have good reasons for doing it the way I would. But the simple truth is, there's good reasons for my kids doing what they did, too. And unless I listen, I will never discover the reason for the things that they're doing, particularly when those things are different from what I'm doing. And, and, and they're kids. I mean, they're, their thinking might not be entirely correct. There might be some flaws. In, but, but unless you understand, unless you really understand why they're doing what they're doing and where they're coming from, we'll never be able to gently and in a, in a constructive way correct. And so the only way that happens is, is when we listen. And, and again, this is, this is fathers to kids, uh, but it's also husbands to wives, wives to husbands, friend to friend. It, it, you know, it's not all just about promoting ourselves. It's about, it's about listening. It's about listening to other people. And dads, uh, again, I would just, I would really commend to you the value of in a very intentional way, making sure you're carving out time, I'd say every day, frankly, uh, but uh, on a regular basis to listen to your kids at supper, Without being nosy, you know, without being nosy, and resisting the, the impulse to, autobiog to autobiographize, right? Kid says something, and that's, that's a segue for me to tell you, well, let me tell you my story. Uh, resisting the urge to judge, but to really listen. And, you know, at night when a kid's going to bed, particularly when they're young, when you say prayers to the kid, great way to talk, what can I, what can I pray for you tonight? All these are opportunities to genuinely listen and make a connection with your kid. Be curious, that's how it starts. And then really listen. And then the next thing is just to create a no negative zone. To create a safe place. And safe places are places where we don't have to worry about people going negative. And frankly, I'd encourage, I, literally, 
I'd encourage you to make a family pledge and to write it up and to sign it and put it on the refrigerator or something. And the family pledge would be, in this house, we will not put each other down. We will not be mean. We will not be, you put it in your own words. But in this house, we're going to be positive with one another. And, and when we made rules like this, and you don't make many because, because rules, you can't keep too many rules. And, and it's, uh, uh, but when we would make rules in our house, we would establish consequences. And so, you know, I've told you this before, one of the rules in the Marola household was when somebody says no, that's no, and you have to stop. And if you don't, you have to go sit on the bed for 15 minutes. So if I'm tickling my kids and my kids say stop, and I think, oh, they don't really want me to stop. They like being tickled. This is so much fun. And I keep tickling them, and they say, Dad, stop and go sit on the bed. <laughs> then I would have to go sit on the bed. And I got sent to the bed very frequently. I mean, I, mean, I uh, you know, 15 minutes. Can I come out now? No. It's only been 12 minutes. OK. But, but again, you might say, you know, in this family, we will not be negative. At the dinner table, nobody's allowed to say anything sarcastic. I mean, sarcastic is often a cheap way, to, a sort of cowardly way to say what we really have issues with. Nobody will ever say anything mean at this table. Nobody will be unkind at this table. And if we are, Dad, go to the bed. You know, and Dad's got to get up from the dinner table, let his dinner get cold, and he's got to go sit on the bed. But, but to, to, to really see people, and to really have people let you see them, why don't our kids uh, often let us see them? Because they don't think it's safe for us to see them, because they think we're going to judge them or tell them. And so, you know, that, that, that knowledge that we're, we're not going to be unkind, we're not going to be mean, we're not going to be sarcastic, we're not gonna, that's just so very important. And I'd literally encourage you to sign a pledge, make a family pledge, and figure out what you think the consequence is. Maybe it's not go sit on the bed, I don't know. Maybe it's go to, maybe it's go to bed without your dinner. But, uh, but when it happens, even if you're an adult, man, you got to obey the rules. you got to obey the rules, because that teaches kids to do that as well. So no negative zone, and, then, and that means uh, uh, creating a safe place. And then, and then the final piece of that is uh, to love and affirm your kids, and to make sure you do that verbally. And when they're home, they tell you to do that. You need to do that at least three times a day, at least three times a day. And if they're not home, then do make sure you do it on a regular basis. I mean, it makes some sense to, to, to call uh, a kid every now and then and say, you know what, uh, I'm not calling even to talk. I know you're busy. I know you're running 100 miles an hour, and so am I. But I just want to say I love you. Bye. I mean, you know, that, that's a powerful phone call. That's a powerful phone call because you're not calling for any other reason. Talking to them, we get something out of that, right? We're not calling for any other reason except just to say we love them. So, and same thing, husbands, wives, friends, really important to make those verbal uh, uh, expressions of love. So those are the four steps in this process. To be curious, because you don't know the people you think you know, I guarantee you. Uh, sometimes as a priest, one of the most interesting things is, because that's a lot of what I do as I listen, is I do come to know a lot of people, and I see how the people that are even close to them don't really know them. Uh, but a lot of times it's not safe for these people to... So anyhow, uh, be curious, uh, listen, uh, create, a, create a, a, a negative free space and love and affirm one another, and particularly uh, do that verbally. The process I'm talking about has sometimes been called the ladder of wonder. And this was uh, something that was, uh, Harville Hendricks came up with this, and uh, I think Harville Hendricks has gone a little off the deep end in recent years, but I've found his stuff really, really helpful uh, for, in, in, for the most part, really, really helpful personally. And so he has the ladder of wonder, and this is sort of the process we're talking about. And he's talking about what we do with the way that other people are different from us, the otherness of other people. Because everybody's unique, and again, it's the ways that people are different than us that cause us to judge them, right? It's the ways, and that we marry people because they're different from us. But somewhere along the line, those differences start to threaten us, and so we want to stamp them out. And, you know, we love our kids, but when it's the ways that our kids are different than us that can be so threatening to us, and so we want to make them in our own image. And every parent who's ever been has always struggled with that. And so the question is, how do we allow our differences to encourage this process of wonder rather than a process of judgment and allow us to draw us closer together rather than pulling us apart? So he calls this the ladder of wonder, and he talks about what we do with our differences, our otherness. And he says, we start by simply acknowledging that the other person is different, that my son or daughter is different. Then I um, accept that they're different, which is different than acknowledging. I acknowledge it, but I don't like it. And then I accept it. And then I actually affirm it. And then a step further, I appreciate that difference. I appreciate that otherness. And then I actually admire that otherness. 
and then I'll actually advocate. I'll go to bat. I'll go to the, uh, you know, I'll go to, to whatever lanes it takes so that my kid knows that I'm in their corner for them to be who they are. Uh, you, you know, my younger daughter is a huge video gamer, and she's darn good at it. And she started at a time where there were tremendous bias and prejudices against uh, video games. A lot of that's changed because people realize how much value there is in that in just a whole bunch of levels. Uh, but I, you know, I've, I've always championed my daughter. Uh, and I've, I've been every bit as proud of her winning a Halo tournament at some electronic festival with all these college-age kids as I would have been as if she'd hit home runs every time at a baseball game, whatever. I mean, you champion your kids, you advocate your kids, and you advocate your husband and wife as well. You, you, you don't, you know, advocate your friends. You don't talk about them when behind their backs. You don't, you advocate them. You advocate your boss, you advocate your workers. You, you, that, it's important. And then the final stage in this process is you adore is you actually come to adore. And that is the ultimate uh, step in this process, and it's ultimate, and it's a strong word. Adore is a really emotional word. It's sort of a touchy, it's a little bit too strong for me even. I mean, adore, come on, I don't know I can really do adoration. But that's, that's really the, the direction that we're moving. I adore my kids. As fathers, we want to adore our kids. As husbands or wives, we want to adore our spouse. As friends, we want to adore our friends. And as Christians, we adore the people around us so that they'll understand how much God adores them. That's what Jesus, again, is talking about. Uh, in, in, in today's gospel in a great many ways. And by the way, I just need to add this. Adoring on Facebook does not count. <laughs> All right? And, 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 and that's funny, but, but, you, but, but, but this is absolutely true because I'll tell you how your kids take this. You, you may not know this, but when you go to Facebook and you talk about how great your kids are, your kids take that as false because what you're doing is you're using that to boost yourself. And real adoration is person to person, eyeball to eyeball, and that's where that sort of stays. And when we go on Facebook and say, man, my kid is so great, just did that, 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 kids look at that and say, there's mom or dad, man. They're just, they're using me to, to, to talk about how great they are, and they don't receive that as adoration at all. In fact, in many ways, they receive that as betrayal. A lot of, that's a lot of reason that they're not on Facebook, is that uh, they just, they find that very distasteful. So adoration on Facebook does not count. Always better for other people to praise your kids and for uh, publicly. And, uh, and it's always good for you to be real clear with them, eyeball to eyeball, face to face. Uh, that, that's where it really, really matters. Well, one quick story on this and then we're done. Uh, story of my dad. And as you know, uh, and I've been good about not talking about this, but Father's Day, maybe, maybe I'm allowed. Uh, as you know, my dad died uh, December 22nd. And about two weeks before he died on his last good day, uh, last really good day, uh, uh, Paul Schmidt, one of our prisoners who has a plane, flew Christine, my older daughter, and I down to see him in, in, in North Carolina. And we got, only got there for about three hours. But my dad really loved my older daughter. He, he loves both my daughters. Uh, but Christine was so good because she was always curious about my father. And, you know, my dad, in many ways, quite frankly, was a dinosaur. Uh, I mean, he was sort of a dying breed. And, and most people would have sat in judgment of my father, not been curious about him. My dad is very conservative. Uh, my daughter is not. And, you know, a lot of people aren't, have just really been just really, uh, particularly of, of younger generations, have been really, really hard. But because Christine was so curious about my dad, and she genuinely listened without judging, uh, my dad loved Christine. And Christine loved him. I mean, they had a really special relationship. And so when Christine came in that afternoon, she, my dad just beamed. I mean, he just lit up. He was so happy to see her. And, and after about three hours, time came to go. And my dad was being careful because he was still, still having some good days to really sort of gush on people, to express love and affirmation for people. So before he left, he really gushed on Christine, talked about, you know, how great she was. And then he saw his wife, my mom, and he gushed on my mom, what a lovely woman, and how much he loved her. And my older sister there, Claire, he gushed on Claire. And then he got to me, and he's doing everybody named Christine, you know, my wife, Jean, Claire, and Robbie. And then there's just like nothing to say. It's just, it just like, <laughs> and, and it's like he can't find anything good to say, which was kind of funny uh, because I, I really think when it comes right down to it, um, truth be told, I think every son or daughter probably has the sneaking suspicion or sneaking fear that we have in some way disappointed our parents, right? Who can really live up? It's, it's not true. It's not true, but we all have this sneaking suspicion that we have, right? Who can really live up to these people who are, who are so big in our eyes? And, and so, you know, it was, it, it was sort of no uh, surprise to me that perhaps I disappointed my dad that he didn't really have anything. He had all these good things to say about everybody else, but he hadn't, didn't have anything good to say about me. And the fact that he could acknowledge that at this stage in his life and make a joke about it, 
actually did my heart some good. And so we all laughed. You know, Christine, this is great. Jean, she's great. Claire, she's great. And Robbie, nothing. And we all, we all just laughed. But, but my dad was actually gathering his thoughts. And he, he waited a minute, and then he said, uh, and then he said, and Robbie, you always made life interesting. <laughs> and he meant that in the best of ways. And truth be told, that is what I have always tried to do. I mean, wh whatever it is, I hope that life with me is not boring. Uh, and, and so, and, and you know what? That might not quite be adoration, but it was pretty darn close. And that just felt so good. It was such a great gift, uh, and it made such a big difference to me. And so I hope today that in continuing the ministry of Jesus, letting people know how much God loves them, that you will really take the time to see the people around you, your sons and daughters, your mothers and fathers, your husbands and wives, significant others, your friends, your neighbors. In seeing them, you'll allow your heart to go out to them. And that will direct the ways that you care for them and let them know how very important to you they are. Amen. Amen. Amen.